LINK stands for Learning Introspective Control. It's basically the idea that you have a system, a robot, a vehicle, an aircraft, and it has a bunch of sensors. And as it's operating, things can change around it. It can get broken, it can be damaged. How does it figure out how to keep on going? Human beings are very, very good at this. Human beings, we can pick up loads that we're not used to, we can stumble and we can recover. Mechanical systems are not real good at this. So the idea behind Link was to be able to provide this type of capacity to systems so they could keep working if they're damaged, if they're hurt, or they encounter something they've never seen before. So why do this? There are a couple of reasons. One is a lot of people are killed in vehicles every year. A lot of these are due to loss of control. Up armored Humvees are very difficult to control because the weight has changed from where the designers originally intended. So if we could make these safer, we'd save a lot of people's lives. One of the examples of where this could really, really be useful was the Ever Given. The Ever Given was a ship that walled the Suez Canal and shut down global supply chains. Part of what happened was unexpected winds came across the ship in the canal. The ship was unable to continue straight down the canal, but the acceleration caused it to be sucked into the wall. If there had been a system, an artificial intelligence system that could provide suggestions to the operator as to how to recover, the accident may have been avoided. Link is not about relinquishing control to AI. It's using AI as an advisor, as an aid, as a safety mechanism for operating large, complex, and difficult systems. It also means that when someone is just learning, they may not have all of the skill, but the system can aid as a buffer to prevent them from being hurt. We tend to think of AI as being these massive systems that take hundreds of megawatt hours to train and to learn. We're looking at essentially the same compute power and the same battery that you find in a cell phone. So it's almost no power at all, it means that it can be used, it can be put in many applications, and it's not generating a big carbon footprint. Currently, we're stationed here at the RVR, which is the robotic vehicle range. We're able to measure success by basically inducing a failure in the robot's um, control system that causes them to go unstable in such a manner that then they have to come up with a new control scheme and adapt on the fly uh, to regain control. From then on, we measure how long they can maintain the safety of this new safe control schema. These robots are fielded robots from the Army but we're also using them as surrogates and measure for larger vehicles. If it can stand still in a high wind, if it can stand still on a steep slope and be able to tell it, sit, stay, that's a very, very good outcome. So some of the outcomes from this are not as exciting if you're not looking at the math as they might otherwise be. It still is really neat. We had a couple of really pleasant surprises throughout this activity. One of them was we saw emergent behavior that showed the system was not only adapting to damage that had been done to it, but it was using its environment to its advantage. An example of that was we had damaged treads, a robot couldn't turn in a given direction because there were high winds in the test site, and the robot suddenly started to tack. It used the wind to help it turn, much the way a sailing boat would, but it learned how to do this and overcome its damage using what was available in the environment. So the LINK program is asking whether we can build a, a safety vest where somehow AI could assure the operator of the vehicle that it'll be safe. Our approach is to uh, learn as much, to build the models of these uh, vehicles in using either simulators, physics simulators, or using physics equations, the kinematics models as they're called, but then also calibrate them with some experiments in the field. So the advantage of this approach is that the number of experiments that you need to do is drastically lower than if you didn't have this model. 
we are working on the functionality controllers, so making sure that whatever the user wants to execute, we will be able to execute it, regardless of the type of damage or situation that the robot is encountering. We read what the user is putting as input into the joystick commands. The goal of this entire system is to make sure that this intent from the user is properly executed. So what we do at the beginning is that we just forward the information through to the robot, and the robot executes it, and then we use our sensors to try to see how well it was executed. And it's constantly learning, but it's also learning very quickly. So right now, for instance, in this example, we adapted in 20 seconds. This is the kind of things where we can even go faster when we, we manage to process the sensory data uh, more accurately and uh, at a higher frequency. Uh, so we are quite optimistic that we can bring this kind of uh, adaptation level uh, probably below uh, dozens of seconds in the next uh, couple of iterations. So we take sort of two inputs. So we have the input of the driver, where they want to go, and then we have the input of the sensory system, which is helping the driver to manage what's around the vehicle. Because if they're in a situation where they're being shot at or, or really overstressed, they can't pay attention to everything. So we actually use methods from the finance industry that actually assess risks in portfolios to actually manage and ca calculate these risks. Then the next level we say, okay, given the driver's intent and the risks, we have something which we call MCTS, which is Monte Carlo Tree Search, which actually searches over hundreds of thousands of possible actions every second to figure out which actions satisfy the user's goal, but also minimize the risks to the vehicle and the driver as well. Traction control is really important. And in this program, we want to assume that actually the terrain is incredibly varied and changing. So once we take the goal, then the next step is for the low level control system that uses the navigation and adjusts the tracks to drive the driver and then actually adapts as necessary uh, to the terrain to carry out the goals from those higher level systems. So that's the basics. And then the whole time we're monitoring all the sensors to look for unexpected kind of events so that we need to jump into action and sort of change our plan. Earlier today, there was a checkered board that was in front of the robot that we had. And because we are, we are using VIO, it's essentially you're using landmarks that we are seeing in the environment to uh, recognize where the robot is in the environment. And as the checkered board was like, you know, moving uh, in the environment, basically the robot was compensating, thinking that, oh, I am moving in the environment. And so it's a pretty exciting challenge. And so we're learning you know, how to build these kinds of systems because no one's ever put all that combinations of things together before. In the next phase of Link, we're moving off of the demonstration platforms, which actually are fielded systems, but we'll be going to much more complex coupled systems that represent operating challenges to DOD today. And we're hoping to eliminate those challenges.